Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. The 11 disciples travelled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. Then Jesus came near and said to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Going, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, well, in your newsletters, there's an outline there on the left-hand side, household questions top right. Keep that A4 sheet out. I'll be referring to that a little later on. And there is a, a sermon series postcard that looks like this. Uh, make sure that you remember the memory verse. And here's what we're looking at over the next four weeks. Well, school's kicked off. Uh, we've survived our first week. Tell me which schools these mottos belong to. Strive to succeed. Which school's that? Narrabri High. No. Wet, what is it? West. Thank you, Louise. Still at knowledge is power. Narrabri Public, Narrabri High. Honour and truth. St Xavier's, that's right. Uh, schools love their mottos. Uh, they're really succinct statements there that appear below their crests. Uh, mission statements, vision statements, just a way to summarise what a school is on about. Uh, now, I'm the first to admit that I shudder when people bring corporate speak into the church, but sometimes succinct or simple phrases are really helpful for us to think about who we are. Now, Bray Anglican Church has one, doesn't it? It has three. Well, actually, no, we're, we're expanding it to four words that start with G. They're there on the bottom of your newsletter, aren't they? On the front cover, they're on all of our letterheads. They're on all of our documents. Have you ever thought about what those words actually mean? Have you thought about how we might apply those words to everything we do as God's people? Over the next four weeks, we're going to be thinking through that four-word summary, one word a week, and we're going to do it using the same Bible passage every week, Matthew 28, 16 to 20. So hold on to those A4 sheets, bring them along each week. Today we're looking at gospeling, which is a word we've added, a word I've made up, which means I can spell it any way I'd like, but it's the word at the foundation of who we are. Let me pray, and we're going to look at gospeling together. Dear God, thanks for your word. I thank you that we can open it. I thank you that we can hear it read, hear it explained. Thank you that it is good news, so different to so much of the news in this world. Father, thank you that it is good news worth sharing. Thank you that it is good news that transforms. Thank you that it is good news that gives us a certain vision of the future. Father, help us to be a good news gospeling people. Amen. I have point two on the outline. Jesus has been raised from the dead. He's appeared to his closest followers. And in Matthew 26, he's commanded his followers to meet him in Galilee after he comes back from the dead. That moment's come. Look at verse 16. The 11 disciples travelled to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped and some doubted. How many disciples were there? Eleven. How did they respond when they saw him? Well, let me summarise it simply for you. They are an incomplete bunch of doubtful worshippers. They're an incomplete bunch of doubtful worshippers. Does that sound familiar to you? The reality of Jesus' disciples is very clear. They're not perfect. They're not talented. They're not finished works. They're not even completely sure about whether Jesus is really who he says he is. But that's the group Jesus meets with. More importantly, that's the group, an incomplete bunch of doubting worshippers, that's the group Jesus gives 
his final words to. And there in verses 18 to 20, point three on the outline. Then Jesus coming near and said to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Going therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now that's a slightly clunky way of translating it, but I want us to capture everything that Jesus says, everything that's said about him. So look at that sheet that I've given you. Uh, You'll notice that Jesus has a command. It's smack bang in the middle. And it's between the sandwich of two reassurances. The first is in verse 18. It describes the nature and power of Jesus. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Jesus has been granted the supreme authority across the whole universe. Notice it's in the past tense. It refers to a previous event. That's his resurrection. No one else has walked out of a tomb. No one else has beaten death. No one else has been raised from the grave never to die again. No one else has lived such a perfect life that no coffin could keep them in the ground. The second reassurance is in verse 20. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. It's the reassurance of Jesus' relationship. He's so unlike any other ruler or authority in the world. Jesus has supreme power and authority and he uses it to reassure those who are entrusted to him. He uses it to empower them, to equip them, to enable them. He doesn't use it to dominate them, to frighten them, to keep them in their place. And in between those two reassurances, who Jesus is and how he relates is a command. It's there in the red. Make disciples. And then in the blue, you'll see the three ways you do that. You'll be going, baptizing, and teaching. Jesus' command is very clear. Because he has all authority in heaven and on earth. Do you see the therefore in verse 19? Because he has all that power and authority, he then gives his disciples a command. You notice that's how they're described in verse 11. He says to his disciples, make disciples. Go and do that by going and baptizing and teaching. It's an all-encompassing command backed by all-encompassing power enabled by an all-encompassing presence. Do you notice how many times all takes place in what Jesus says? It's a very simple command. Make disciples. Be disciple-making disciples, going, baptizing, and teaching. Now, we're going to unpack that over the next three weeks, but today I just want to focus on two very simple questions. What is a disciple and how do you make one? What is a disciple And how do you make one? So I want you to take a moment. I'm at point four on the outline. Just have a quiet chat with the person next to you and come up with a definition for disciple. Just have a quiet chat. I'll give you one minute. Come up with a definition for disciple. Well, you've got the rest of morning tea to discuss uh, that. Uh, God willing, we'll have a bit of clarity about it. I love it when uh, Scripture kicks off. It's kicking off on March the 2nd this year, so please be praying for that. Uh, I love spending time with uh, the kids in school, talking to them about facts to do with Jesus. Uh, For example, uh, Jesus was a carpenter for 18 years before he got baptised. Kids are always shocked that Jesus was a tradie, but that's what he was. For 18 years. Our kids are always shocked when I tell them they are all my disciples. Because that's what the word disciple means, a a student of someone. 
someone who has a teacher. And Jesus helps us understand that a little more clearly in Matthew chapter 10. If you want to follow along, it's on page 863. Otherwise, I'll have most of the verses up here on the overhead. Uh, Jesus has gathered 12 disciples. He's picked a select bunch. He's about to send them out on their first job. And so he has time with them, talking to them about what it will look like to do this job. They've left everything behind to follow him. Jobs, family, relationships. And he tells them four key ideas about what a disciple is. The first is in verse 24. A disciple is not above his teacher or a slave above his master. A disciple has a teacher. Do you notice that a disciple is never above their teacher? A really interesting reminder to us about our relationship with Jesus. Secondly, in verse 25, a disciple becomes like his teacher. It's enough for a disciple to become like his teacher, a slave like his master. They will change and imitate and follow the one who's teaching them. In verses 37 to 39, a disciple is wholehearted. The person who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. The person who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Anyone finding his life will lose it. Anyone losing his life because of me will find it. A disciple is wholehearted in their devotion to their teacher, every fibre, every desire, every thought, every part. In verse 25, a disciple will be treated just like their teacher. If they called the head of the house bills about literally the devil, how much more the members of his household? So as a disciple learns from the teacher, becomes like the teacher, is wholehearted in following the teacher, the world's going to look at them like they do the teacher. Whatever they said about Jesus, they're going to say about you. Whatever they did to Jesus, they're going to do to you. So here's a disciple. A disciple is a wholehearted student follower of Jesus. A disciple is a wholehearted student follower of Jesus. To be a disciple is to have someone or something that you learn from, a teacher. To be a disciple is a matter of heart, desire, devotion, not just action and behaviour. To be a disciple is to be someone who is changed all over. To be a disciple is so to follow the teacher that the world looks at you, treats you just like the teacher. It's really important for us to grasp this for two reasons. First, Jesus always describes his followers as disciples. In fact, that's the description of God's people right throughout the New Testament. Uh, The word Christian only happens twice and it's incidental. The Bible's description of God's people is disciple. Disciple. Second, everyone is part of a discipling program. Everyone. Uh, Whether it's in your sporting club, whether it's in your family, whether it's through your social media networks, whether it's through the education system or political parties, just by being a human being in the world, you're being discipled. Everyone is being discipled by someone or something that wants to claim our hearts, our footsteps, our devotion, and to remake us. Jesus knows that, doesn't he? And so he's presenting an alternative discipleship program to all the programs that we will meet in the world. It's an alternative that offers us the good life, if you remember from what we've just looked at. Now, if that's what a disciple is, then how do you make one? Really easy to make a cake, isn't it? You just follow the recipe. (laughs) If only it was that simple with disciple making. But let me tell you, we're actually given the really important key point, aren't we? A disciple is a wholehearted student follower of Jesus. The key step in making a disciple is meeting Jesus, isn't it? 
That is the key part in making a disciple. We have numerous statements about that right throughout the New Testament. And more often than not, they're described as a gospel. Here's how Mark begins his biography of Jesus, the beginning of the gospel. Of who? Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Uh, A gospel is a really simple idea. Uh, God didn't make it up in the Bible. He just borrowed a phrase that humans used. Gospels were really common in the Roman Empire. A gospel is an announcement about how the world has changed and whoever hears it has got to adjust. Uh, It could be an announcement from the Roman emperor that there's a new heir to the throne and you've got to adjust to that. could be the good news that you've conquered a whole new territory and you've got to adjust to that. It could be the news that there is a brand new Caesar on the throne and you've got to adjust to that. In each instance, a gospel is sent out. A new reality is here and you've got to adjust to that new reality. In fact, Jesus himself announces a gospel. Look there in Mark 1, 14 to 15, after Jesus was arrested, after John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee preaching the good news of God. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. When Jesus stands up in his hometown, The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news, the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Gospel is there in Old and New Testament. Gospel is there when people look at Jesus and when Jesus himself talks. Each time Jesus says, there's a new world order. There's a new reality. Please adjust your life in response to that. Do you notice the adjustment Jesus suggests? Repent. Turn around. Turn away from thinking that you're God and turn to the one true God. Now that good news is actually passed on, isn't it? That good news is proclaimed, preserved and passed on and we heard that earlier on as a bloke called Paul wrote to a bunch of Christians in a town called Corinth. Now brothers, I want to clarify for you the gospel I proclaim to you. You received it and have taken your stand on it. You, You also are saved by it if you hold to the message I proclaim to you unless you believe to no purpose. For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died, was buried for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was raised. He appeared to Kephas and then to the Twelve. The Gospel is about Jesus. The good news is that Jesus lived, died, and rose. The good news is that Jesus achieved the forgiveness of sins. The good news is that this is the eternal plan of God. And that is so powerful that it will save people. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's God's power for salvation to who? Everyone who believes. First to the Jew, also to the Greek. It's powerful. It saves. It fixes broken people. It's received by trusting in Jesus. It calls for a radical turnaround. It offers reconciliation with God. It's always proclaimed. Do you notice that about Jesus? He proclaims it time and time again. It's also practiced. Do you notice that with Paul? Take your stand on it. Good news. Proclaimed, practiced, preserved, passed on all about Jesus, and that good news begins a process. It begins a lifelong process where someone is a wholehearted student follower of Jesus. Uh, If you wanted to be provocative, you'd say, Jesus isn't interested in Christians, he's interested in disciples. Jesus is interested in disciples, people who walk wholeheartedly with him as Lord and Saviour. And if you look back at those last words of Jesus, in verse 18, you have the gospel summarised. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. There's the good news. 
There's a Lord and Saviour on the throne. He's not a mentor. He's not a buddy or a mate. He's not a life coach or a wise old man. He's the Lord of the universe. And because he's the Lord, he's beaten death and so he can save you from the brokenness of thinking you are God. He can forgive you and bind you up and heal you and set you on the path of true humanity as a member of God's mob. All humans need to hear this, and anyone who receives it is a disciple. And as a disciple, they make more disciples. They're disciple-making disciples who proclaim the good news going to all the nations. So at the last point on the outline, let me just summarise where we've been. Jesus commands his disciples to make disciples. A disciple is a wholehearted student follower of Jesus. A disciple is made by meeting Jesus. That happens through the proclamation, hearing and practice of the good news, the gospel, and then disciples are gospeling. They make more disciples by sharing that good news. So to put it simply, who are we? We're a gospeling mob. We're about the good news of Jesus Christ, its proclamation and practice, so that others come to know the goodness of Jesus. That's why we've put it there as one of our four summary words. In fact, it's the foundation word, isn't it? Because without gospeling, we haven't got the other three, have we? We are a gospeling mob. So what's that going to look like tomorrow morning? Uh, That's been a really helpful way. Uh, Someone said to me a while back, Bernard, you need to help us see what it looks like on Monday morning. So what does it look like on Monday morning? Well, let me ask two questions. The first is really simple. We just forget it. Have you met Jesus in the gospel? Have you met Jesus in the gospel? Very easy not to ask that question in a context like this. We just assume it, don't we? Have you met Jesus in the gospel? The man who lived the life I desperately should have but just couldn't. The man who died death for me. The man who rose from the dead so that I could be made whole again, reconciled to God. Have you met the man Have you met the man who desired to forgive your sins so that you could be truly human? Have you met the man who rules the universe with unrivaled power and loves you? Are you a disciple of Jesus? That's digging a little further, isn't it? Now, as I didn't ask if you're a Christian, are you a disciple of Jesus? a wholehearted student follower of the Lord of the universe, not treating him as a life coach, not treating him as one of those desk calendars full of really wise sayings, not treating him as a mentor or advisor or a good bloke, but following him as the boss of the universe who has beaten death for you. That's the first question. Second question. Where does gospeling happen? Where does gospeling happen? Where must it happen? Well, Jesus gives us a hint there, doesn't he? Do you notice he says, make disciples of all nations. Gospeling happens in all places. Gospeling happens in our homes and our households and our families. Gospeling is the good news ever present within the four walls and roof of my house, in our families, in our households. It's the discipling of children by their parents. It's the discipling of ourselves through the word of God. This is so crucial because we're all being discipled with some form of good news, aren't we? 
Are we going to be discipled by the best news? It's simply a matter of reading and praying God's word. It's not a task that can be abdicated, outsourced, even delegated to any other church community. Gospeling happens in our homes. Gospeling happens in our community, doesn't it? happens with our neighbours at work, in our cafes, our sporting clubs, when we go on camping trips, water skiing at Yarry Lake, in our leisure time, in our gyms, in our schools. In all of those places, the good news needs to be heard, doesn't it? That Jesus is Lord and Saviour. Gospelling happens when we gather. We're going to look at that next week. But as we gather... In church, we're gospeling. The shape of our gathering is the gospel. The content of our gathering is the good news of Jesus. All the activities we do, men's ministry, youth group, playtime, women's ministry, Bible study groups, everything we do as a mob, are we gospeling? Are we gospeling? And it must take place throughout the whole world, mustn't it? Go into all the nations, and we're going to look at that in three weeks' time. Who are we? We're a gospeling mob. We proclaim and practice the good news of Jesus so that disciples are made and we are growing as disciples. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thanks for the good news that Jesus left everything and expressed who he was by taking on flesh and coming to us. Father, that was the first real mission trip, wasn't it? As you sent your son to go into all the world so that we could know who he truly was, the one who would live for us, die for us and rise for us so that our sins could be forgiven, so that we could be turned back to you so that we could be his disciples. Father, this is good news. Please help us to be a gospeling mob. In Jesus' name, amen.